I was getting protected back then by the New Mexican Mafia, who were the most powerful and violent criminal organization in Arizona. How does a nerdy business graduate from Widnes end up getting protected by the New Mexican Mafia? Day one of the job, my boss slaps the phone book down and says, you need to call 500 numbers a day to find people to buy shares. In the beginning, I wasn't any good at it, but five years in, I'm the top guy in the office, grossing half a million a year, got my own staff, secretary, call callers, all in my 20s, got enough money to retire. Put that money into technology shares, they shut up. That was how I became a millionaire. And I started to throw rave parties with it. I started giving the pills out for free. And when you give pills out for free, you know, you attract a lot of friends and this was just boosting my ego. But eventually my business studies degree took over and greed. And I started to apply that knowledge. I went out to LA, picked up a few thousand pills, brought them back, sold them pretty quickly. I'm getting up to 5,000 to 10,000 from LA at a time. And my organization is getting so big now, I've got like 200 people working for me, I've got my own team of bouncers, they've all got tasers and guns and stuff, throwing parties for up to 10,000 people. So I need more pills and the LA dealers can't supply enough. So I send people out to Holland with testing kits, they brought them back and we negotiated the price down to $3 or less, buying tens of thousands of hits. They would put the pills in just in pillowcases in their luggage or if they wanted to be more secure they could screw them into computer towers and then put them on the plane. This was back in the 90s and they weren't that hip to what ecstasy even looked like. I had one smuggler, she got stopped. They took the pill jars out of the luggage and they said so what are they? They said oh they're vitamins and they said cool they just put them back in the luggage and have a nice day. My competitor in the ecstasy market was Sammy the Bull Gravano, underboss of the Gambino crime family. He'd murdered almost two dozen people. And later on in prison, his son told me he'd been dispatched one night to kidnap me from a nightclub and take me out to the desert. And the only reason they'd missed us is because my best mate, Wild Man, had had a scuffle and we'd had to leave that club in a hurry. So on the drugs, it was telling me, you're Mr. Cool Guy. But when I sobered up in prison and looked back on all the situations I put myself in, I was like, how on earth are you still alive? I was getting protected back then by the New Mexican Mafia, who were the most powerful and violent criminal organization in Arizona. They were trying to assassinate the head of the department of the prisons. They've been assassinating judges, uh, police, witnesses. I was supplying pills to an apartment party and another guy came and he was supplying coke and weed. We hit it off and we have a conversation. And then a policeman intrudes the party. He just walks in, he goes, I could smell weed outside. Nobody move and he's about to call it in and have everybody arrested. The guy I'm speaking to, the Mexican American guy, just pulls out his gun, puts it at the cop's head and says, the only one who's not leaving is you motherfucker. Everybody else go. So we all ran out into the night. So I'm hiding in one of these apartments with my buddies. Next thing there's like a bang, 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 bang on the French window. It's the Mexican American guy. He's like, let me in, let me in. So we let him in. And at the end of it all, he said, look, because you and your mates protected me, me and my brothers have got your back. A month or so later, he says, my brothers want to meet you. I go to this house. It's got all these low rider show cars on the road. And then this short, stocky Mexican American guy opens the door to me. So I go into the living room. There's all these massive tattooed Mexican American guys, prison tats all over them, wearing wife beaters, shorts down over the knees, chains. And they're just looking at me like, you know, who is this, who is this guy kind of thing? None of them smiled at all. So I'm getting a bit nervous in this environment and look over at the TV. They got the biggest TV I've ever seen in my life. And then on the TV, I'm thinking, 
well, it can't be. I'm sure I saw that in a Rambo movie. Holy shit, it is. It was a rocket propelled grenade launcher. Yeah. So every time I went back to that house, I was crapping it. I didn't stay there very long. They never smiled ever. They took some ecstasy from me. And then they called me up and they said, Sean, we've run out of ecstasy, we're having a little party. Can you bring some more over? And when I went over there, they were all off their faces on the ecstasy, these mafia dudes. And they were, pick, they were picking me up like they were big, sweaty teddy bears and like, yeah, England man and all this stuff. <laughs> I never ever saw them smile again after that night. I thought they had to catch you with the drugs. But all it takes in Arizona is someone from seven years from your past under the statute of limitations to say you've sold drugs to them and they've got a witness. They don't actually need the drugs. Now, during that last year when I wasn't dealing anymore, I was still going out on the weekends getting high and they got me talking about personal use in coded words on the phone. May 16th, 2002. There was a knock on my door that ended everything. Bang, 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 bang. So I jump up from the computer, look through the peephole, and it's blacked out. Go over to the bedroom to my girlfriend. And we're like, what, what should we do? We're like, all right, we better let them in. Halfway through the living room, then boom, the door just flies off the hinges. Hands above your heads, get on the ground, don't move. You know, you see them all open up with those guns and you just drop like that because you think if they start shooting, your life is over in seconds. It's all completely gang controlled. So as soon as I go in, four skinheads from the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood prison gang just come up to me and they're like, hey, we want a word with you getting that cell back there. And the biggest one gets in my face He's like, what are your charges? What are your charges? And are you a chomo? Are you a chomo? I don't know what chomo is either, but chomo is child molester. So I'm just making my situation 10 times worse because I'm new to this. They've got me up against the wall now about to smash me. I show them my charge sheet. They see I'm in for drugs. Nearly everyone's in prison, for it's drugs related. And they saw my bail was $750,000 and they thought that was cool. And then they left me alone after that. Some charges are KOS by the gang, which means kill on sight, such as paedophile stuff. Other charges, SOS, smash on sight, such as drive-by shootings, because women and kids sometimes get hit. Anyone coming in with a sex offence or a crime against a woman or a child, right away a gang is going to try and murder them, or at the very least they're going to smash them. That's called convict justice. If someone calls you a punk, a bitch, Hits you, you, hits you, you gotta fight them on the spot or else the whole gang will smash you. Must take showers or they'll smash you for bad hygiene. Can't go making friends with the guards, they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sitting at the tables with the other races, they'll smash you for that. Everything you take for granted about your safety is reverse. To be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhoods get patched in, you've got to murder someone for them in the jail. It was half Hispanic where I was at as well, and you know, you see like the, the solid teardrop, one person that he's murdered for his gang, you see that teardrop outline, sorrow for the loss of a fellow gang member, you murdered a rival who's murdered your gang member, you can fill it in so it's solid, and on and on it goes, so they're constantly looking for people to beat up. My neighbor was a serial killer. My cellmate was a Satanist. He's got a satanic inverted pentagram tattooed on his forehead. And for murder, part of a cult that's drinking blood and eating human body parts. And he was actually very nice to me. The guard who put me in my new cell decided to play a prank on me. He put me in with a guy who was a serial home invader, torturer. This guy was breaking into people's houses and taking hammers to their kneecaps. His welcoming statement to me, night I move in, I've got a padlock in a sock, I can smash your brains in while you sleep, I can kill you whenever I want. Rape is so common in American prison, you've got to go what's called a rape class to get taught how not to get raped. And the class, there's a video, and it shows some predators in the day room, and the young people coming in, and the ones who take the sweets, they're in debt 
and then they can't pay it and they owe sexual favours and then they get punked out. Now if you get punked out, that defines you for the rest of your stay in prison. You're basically going to be performing oral sex and cleaning toilets and getting rented out as a prostitute. They got a shovel from the work crew, held him down, cut his head off with the shovel. When the head was finally off, they positioned it in an area of the prison where the rival gangs would see it to make the point they were the most violent and ruthless out of all the gangs. I take full responsibility for the harm I caused society with drugs. I thought I was keeping the party going. I saw the horror of what the drug use led to in the prison where 90% of the guys were shooting up heroin, shooting up crystal meth. Two thirds had hepatitis C, deadly disease. I knew I couldn't change my past, so I pledged to go out and share my story in the hope young people wouldn't make my mistakes.